right, so three, two, one, and we are live, Dr. Zuleta here, and we are here with Dr. Amy Sapola, who is an integrative uh, medicine pharmacist and a functional medicine pharmacist. So we are so excited to talk to you today, and uh, how have you been? Good. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be talking with you. It's nice to see you again. Yeah, same here, same here. And so can you maybe start telling us a little bit about your background? Yeah, sure. So, um, where to start? <laughs> I think um, I started off uh, with an early interest in kind of integrative medicine, or at that time, alternative medicine. I started practicing yoga at like 15, um, and that really had a huge impact on my life. And so I went to school, to college, and got a four-year degree in nutrition, and really I saw that as like, I knew I was going to go to pharmacy school, um, but I saw that as the foundation of everything. And so I wanted to get that for your degree in nutrition because I really didn't see being a pharmacist as like putting people on medications, but I saw it as a way that I could help intervene and help get people off of medications. So I was just looking at it a little bit differently. Um, then I went to pharmacy school um, and graduated, went up, um, worked at Mayo Clinic for like four and a half years or so, did outpatient pharmacy and then was a specialty pharmacist and got to specialize in the new hep C drugs when they came out, which was cool. So I worked across the campuses uh, in hep C. And then from there, I was working also with like oral oncology and people were having a lot of questions around like herbs and supplements and all the integrative treatments. Um, and I, it really sparked my interest. And so after that, I started just getting more interested. Um, so I left and did a couple other things. Um, I got a 200 hour yoga teacher training I went through. Um, I did an Ayurvedic yoga specialist training. I did a, I became a Reiki master. <laughs> and then um, I signed up for the AIHM fellowship. And so I, that's how I met you and I went through the fellowship, learned a ton. It was great. Um, and then because I'm extra crazy during that time, I decided I was really interested in functional medicine. So started concurrently studying functional medicine and going through all the training and just got my certification um, right before uh, New Year's. So I'm very excited. But that's like the long and short of it. I've been doing a lot of training because so I'm kind of a lifelong student and I really, really enjoy what I'm doing. That's so cool. That's so interesting the way that you talked about how that you got into pharmacy to actually help people get off medications. I think I remember the first time I heard the word deprescribing and that I didn't really know about it. And then when I started really looking into it, that there is like ways of like taking, there is like methodologies that are being developed. And I was like, oh, this is so interesting because we need this so much. Like I was practicing here down in, um, in a town here in Portland. And one of the patients came into a hospital with 40, 42 43 medications like yeah there's medications for medications you know like you have a side effect so then you take something else and then you kind of forget what's causing what and next thing you know you have an incredibly long med list so um and it's really interesting to me too now that i um am in integrative medicine and people kind of know me in the area for that people are a lot more honest about everything they're taking. So you might see a med list with five things on it, but then they're also taking 20 supplements, you know? And so um, it's nice to see the whole picture, but I think anytime you're taking something, um, it counts, right? And so taking a long list of stuff isn't always necessarily great. And it takes a lot of work on behalf of the patient. And that's something I admire um, Dr. Victor Montori a lot. He talks a lot about the work of being a patient and like these complex re med regimens and all that stuff, you know, um, it really has to be considered. You're so right about that. Uh, I'm working on diabetes a lot right now. And so I started checking my own sugar and what a pain, you know, like I can't imagine now, like even in the hospital now, I think about it like, wow, like it hurts. And so it's like, no wonder why they don't take it. Like our, our brain was wired to actually like, avoid pain so so we're asking patients to cause themselves pain like like it's like almost like a masochist sort of thing you know? like, that totally, oh, yeah that totally rings true with me i so when i was pregnant with my son who was my second child i got gestational diabetes 
And they told me I would have to test my blood sugar four times a day. And I was like, you have to be kidding me. No. (laughs) And I ended up doing it. But then you really learn like the work of being a patient. And like before I wouldn't even blink at telling someone, oh yeah, four times a day, you know? And then when it was actually me, all of a sudden you're like, wait, what? Four times a day? I'm like trying to figure out how I can outsmart the system and like test just like at different times, different days. And then I was like, you know what? No, like I'm not doing myself any favors by doing that. So it was a huge learning experience though. Yeah, definitely. And and then on top of that, then the medications and the side effects and if they, you know, and I think that's uh, it's so awesome to have you in the show because I think um, a pharmacy is such a, I mean, for the first part of my career, I think the first years of residency, you know, pharmacists were not really incorporated into, it's been really a light, a, a trend in the past couple of years because we realized like, what are you doing? Like, we need them in the team. You know, we need you in the team because it's like, adds so much value now. You know, I think we need to uh, even more, you know, to, 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 so that they can become a part of the, uh, of the treatment plan. And, uh, and so for you, how has it been Learn. I mean, now that you've gone through pharmacy school and now that you've been in clinical practice and everything, how do you feel now that you went in, into it with that mentality and now that you've learned so much about it, how has that been going on? Yeah, so I think a few things about this. <laughs> So first, I love being part of a team. And thank you for saying that. I think um, people are starting to realize more of the value a pharmacist can bring in so many different areas. Um, And so I think right now where I practice is a small rural hospital. And um, Dr. Arietta, who you know as well, just came on staff about a year ago. And she's an integrative medicine physician. And so we've been working together as a team, which is fabulous. And so I'm working with her, but also um, we have a primary care clinic and I work with the other physicians as well um, and nurse practitioners. And like in the morning, we'll come to rounds, we'll talk about patients, they'll refer them to me for like one-on-one appointments. They're called medication therapy management. And I'll sit down with people one-on-one and talk to them and then send recommendations back to their primary care provider. Um, So I love that piece of it. I want to do more though, to be very honest. Like, I think, you know, um, there's so many opportunities as a pharmacist for things we could be doing and being really involved in like so many different aspects of care that right now I feel like I'm just scratching the surface. So um, I love what I'm doing, but I want to do more. (laughs) If that makes sense. And I think, you know, learning the integrative medicine piece, um, sometimes it's hard because all staff in our outpatient pharmacy too, and people are all at different places. Like sometimes people are totally receptive and open to hearing what I have to say or how, how we could do things differently. Um, and some people do not want to hear any piece of that. It just want their medication and let me go. Like, you don't even, don't even tell me about it. You know, like my doctor told me to take it and I'm sure it's fine. So yeah, there's a whole, whole breadth of experience there. So for me, um, I also got certified as a wellness coach. And so I really like working with people who are highly motivated for change. And so, especially with the functional medicine piece and integrative medicine piece, that's like my wheelhouse. And I love talking about supplements and all that stuff. Um, So yeah, I think I'd like to do more of that and a little less of, um, you know, kind of working with people who don't necessarily aren't open to change and kind of are fine with where they're at. Because there's plenty of people who are happy to work there. So. Mm-hmm. Oh, you're so right about that. Uh, you know, I was like so mind blowing when I was looking through, I was developing a program or something and I was looking through the word medicine and that the word medicine means actually appropriate action to restore hemostasis. So the word medicine actually means like an action that, that is taken. And so sometimes that action is to take a pharmaceutical, but, but that's actually, that was considered actually taking a poison so poisons and surgeries were like categorized as the last resorts and taking action. So like, I, 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 you, you're so right because many times people don't, are not ready, I think, for, for taking these actions. They don't want to hear it. And I, I agree with you. I think it's so rewarding to, there's a small amount of patients that are ready to go. I think they felt 
pain for some reason, enough, like enough is enough type of suffering, like they're ready to change. And, uh, and I think it's so rewarding because you can start seeing the results, like what you're saying with them. And, uh, and I was wondering, yeah, it's amazing that you say like you want to do more because I feel like, I don't know how many, like how many consoles have you gotten like for like deprescribing, you know, like, yeah. oh, I, like, like, I'm not, I'm not sure. Like, but that should be like a thing, you know? Totally. And that's, you know, this may not sit well with everybody, but I think this frenidine shortage um, or Zantac like got recalled and so it's not available and there's this big shortage. It's actually wonderful in a way because a lot of people are going without it. And maybe you don't need to be on an H2 blocker. Maybe your stomach acid is like not, you know, maybe you're not going to have heartburn anymore, but you've been on it for 10 years. And so I think sometimes things like that can show people that maybe you don't need it. Although we have been seeing a ton of people just switch over to like famotidine or something, but um, it's been neat. Like in our nursing home, they just said, just stop it for everyone who is on it. And then if people have symptoms, we'll treat that. So there's a, lot, a large amount of people who did not have symptoms. They stopped it and, you know, didn't need it, but no one ever thought, along the way until it became unavailable that, hey, maybe we could try not having it. So yeah, I think things like that um, don't happen that often, but are kind of just a nice demonstration of what we could be doing um, with more patients. And H2 blockers, PPIs, like um, heartburn medications are such an easy target <laughs> for most people because a lot of people get put on them and never get taken off. And they can cause um, vitamin and mineral deficiencies, magnesium, something we talk about a lot. Um, so when you're looking at, you know, changing the pH of the stomach, um, definitely can lead to some absorption issues. Hmm. Yeah, you're, and that's such a big medication. How, um, now that this is like such an interesting subject, because so many people are on these medications, so many people. And I even remember one time, like I got a lot, I didn't start a patient that came into the hospital you know, with it, which is like a standard, like, you know, prophylaxis. And I got a little from the other physicians were like, Hey, why didn't you start it? Like a little bit upset about it. And then I showed them all the data. I showed them the studies. I sent them all the latest data on it, which is like overwhelming. Like you don't need it. And, um, and how big is the problem from your perspective? And what, what can people do about it? Or I guess I, yeah. What can people do about it? Because, uh, of the negative aspects of it? I would say it's probably one of the more common recommendations I make is to start trying to at least taper off of PPIs. Um, the one thing I run into a lot is people have a hard time getting off because your acid pumps are being shut down. So you're trying to compensate essentially and you make more acid pumps. So when you stop taking the medication, all of a sudden those acid pumps, which you've been essentially making more of, now turn on and all of a sudden you have an acid hypersecretion basically. Um, so people can experience heartburn symptoms initially with stopping a PPI like suddenly, um, almost worse than they initially had. And so I think stopping over time slowly and letting maybe using other things like uh, DGL um, or people use melatonin or um, slippery elm you could use even like a h2 blocker or tums <laughs> there's a lot of things but you can use crutches in the meantime um but instead of just expecting people to like stop at cold turkey and suffer um you can do it that way but you have to let people know like you might be uncomfortable and just because you're having heartburn again doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to continue to have heartburn um, and I think it's important to put that perspective out there and that expectation that it might take you a couple of weeks to kind of return to a normal or a baseline um, as your stomach adjusts to essentially not having the medication. And what do you think from people listening, um, what would you say is the biggest side effect of these medications, the most dangerous one? Yeah, I think it's really, I mean, it's hard to tell. There's always stuff coming out, but from my perspective, especially with looking at nutrients and absorption, I think like magnesium deficiency, iron deficiency, um, or well, they say increased risk of fracture, right? And so for people aging, um, that's kind of the last thing you want. Um, and then B, 
like your B vitamins, like B12. Um, you can have some malabsorption. So if you're diabetic and you're on metformin and you're on a PPI, like that can add up, you know, and metformin's another one that like likely will cause B12 deficiency within probably five years of taking it um, if you're not otherwise supplementing. So just kind of, I don't know, thinking about it and recognizing um, how your medications could be contributing um, to other problems. And like B12 deficiency in diabetics is super interesting to me because it can show up as peripheral neuropathy. And so you might have tingling in your fingers and uh, toes, um, but how do you know if it's your diabetes worsening or if it's a B12 deficiency, right? So I think um, supplementing in those cases makes a lot of sense. And that's so crazy. Like you mentioned magnesium and it's so amazing, like magnesium, how much like it can really get, like, change somebody's life, you know, if they have headaches or if they have muscle problems or, and if they're taking one of these medications, it could be one of the, uh, one of the ways that they get so much better in their health, you know? Yeah. I was just recording a podcast Sunday and I was talking with someone and I said, you know, if I was on a desert island, I think if I was allowed to bring one supplement, it would probably be magnesium. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I love magnesium for a lot of reasons, but I think, um, like you mentioned, like headaches, muscle tension, um, even like bowel irregularities, um, sleep. There's so many, so many things it's good for. So, and most people are deficient, especially with the condition of our soils. Um, and kind of the monoculture and farming practices, generally, uh, a lot of the population is likely deficient. Yeah, definitely. And um, with one of the things kind of getting into the next from this, um, what do you think about like methylation medicine and like more personalized like prescribing and, and that sort yeah. of thing? I'm super interested in that. So I'll tell you, um, we started a pharmacogenomics consult service at my hospital. Um, recently, the biggest barrier we've been running into is insurance coverage. So right now, the patients who have been referred to us it has not been covered. So we haven't done a ton of it, which kind of stinks. But um, it's interesting. I think it's kind of where things are going. I think we're very early in our knowledge, though. And so I think even functional medicine initially was really pushing like methylation and like, oh, if you have an MTHFR mutation, like, you know, get your methylated B vitamins and everything. But then you kind of run into, well, just because you have a SNP doesn't necessarily mean it's expressed. And like some of these people getting on methylated vitamins are having anxiety um, or just generally not feeling as well with them. Um, and so those are the people that you would want to back off. So I think you still just have to be careful about it, but it's super interesting. And I think um, the other area I find super interesting is nutrigenomics. So looking at not only how your genome affects, um, you know, like drug metabolism and things, but also nutrient metabolism um, or like how, so one of the SNPs has to do with fish oil. So like whether, um, or not fish oil so much as um, ALA, um, so like how well you convert alpha linoleic acid into um, the active form like EPA and DHA. Um, so for some people, they may convert better than others or um, even vitamin A is another one. Um, so yeah, anyway, long answer. <laughs> but I think it's incredibly interesting. I think there's very few covered indications right now and I hope that will really change. Yeah, because it almost seems like if we, in the future, it's like if we're not practicing, like you're right, I guess backing up a little bit, first of all, it's like it's so early that we don't know so much about it, but it does seem like if we did know everything there is to know about it, that it would be like one of the most useful tools to actually be able to say, okay, before I start your metformin, I want to see whether you're going to respond to it or not, or that almost, almost every medication, and when, so when you do the pharmaco um, um, protocols in your hospital, what is the intention uh, that you guys are doing it now? Mm -hmm. So one of the main areas that we started it for was um, like psych drugs. Um, that's a big area with pharmacogenomics is looking at how like helping to steer which um, psych medication you would select for a patient. Um, so that's one area. 
also like Plavix, the like use of Plavix is something that actually is in the package insert um, and you can use pharmacogenomics for that. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Oh, there's seizure, a few indications for seizures, I believe. Um, but yeah, it's still, it's still somewhat limited. I mean, in a pure functional medicine practice where you're doing cash base, you can obviously do a lot more. Um, but in our small rural hospital, we really depend on insurance coverage. So, and, and has any of these tests, has there been a story that any of these tests um, gained any sort of insight as to change the clinical you know, approach that you took with this patient, you and the team? Is there anything yeah. that comes to mind? That's a really good question. I haven't yet because we're still early in the program. Um, and like I said, the insurance coverage just hasn't been there. I think eventually maybe. Um, some of my personal like um, private practice consults I've done, people come in with their genomic information and I'll look at it. Um, it's often interesting to see kind of what they've already been told or what they're already doing based on that. Um, and I would say one of my pet peeves is kind of the MTHFR mutation in some people um, because they'll come in and like be so insistent like, oh my gosh, you know, I have this mutation and like, um, you know, I have to take methylated B vitamins. And I'm like, was your homocysteine high? Like, you know, what else was going on at the time? Like, how do you feel on B vitamins? And like, in the specific case I'm thinking of, they were super anxious. <laughs> like, you know, you don't have to do that. Food is also a methyl donor. Um, so I think, you know, just being, uh, practical about it and using a, like a wider lens than just getting narrowed in on one mutation and assuming you have it just because it comes up, I guess, or assuming it's expressed. So looking at like the epigenetics as well. Right. And, and for some people who's never heard of this and they're listening to this and they're like, what the hell are they talking about? <laughs> you know, what, what would you say? Like, how would you explain to them? Like what? So, cause I'm sure some, some of the people, they can go and get this test and then they kind of, so if you kind of just run through like what you just said, like, what does that mean? And, you know, and kind of break it down. Yeah. So I'll do my best to explain it in like a somewhat understandable way. But um, so first of all, when you do a genetic test, it's usually super easy. It's like you spit in a test tube or a cheek swab, like it's non-invasive, which is super nice. Um, there's also like companies like 23andMe and Ancestry, um, where you can get your raw data and then put it into websites like LiveWellO. Um, that will give you some uh, pharmacogenomic interpretation, which is really nice and it's cheap. It's like 20 bucks or something, um, maybe 60, I don't know. But it's not super expensive. Um, but you don't have someone necessarily sitting with you and talking about how it's relevant for you. And so you're not necessarily having it put into context. But um, so it's out there. Um, and from those, you can get your raw data files, like I said, and put them into numerous different applications. Um, or you can get it done uh, at your doctor's office or, um, you know, various places. But um, the mutation we're talking about is MTHFR. Um, basically, this looks at methylation and methyl groups can kind of turn on or turn off gene expression. And so, um, Essentially, if some people have a certain SNP, it, which is like a variation uh, or way of expressing it, I guess, um, it means that you may not be methylating as well. Um, so it's just, you know, <laughs> it's just complicated. Mm -hmm. But essentially, when you're not methylating as well, um, you can potentially have a buildup of homocysteine. Um, and homocysteine has been linked with heart disease, um, and also it can affect like COMPT, um, which is another SNP, um, which has some relation to like depression and um, like the catecholamines, um, like adrenaline, noradrenaline. Um, so anyway, it all kind of ties together. And so sometimes um, it can be helpful to look, look at those pathways and look at kind of the targets within those pathways and what helps kind of the cycle run. So whether it's adding in like B6, B12, um, 
oh, folic acid, you know, all of those things are really important. Um, and usually it's not a single nutrient. So oftentimes it's um, like many B vitamins together or, you know, B vitamins plus magnesium, but it's really making sure those nutrients are there. Um, what I said earlier though, was also people kind of sometimes forget that it's not all about supplements. So your diet has a huge effect on your genetic expression. Um, so the things you're eating can affect, um, like whether your genes are turned on or off. Um, so that's an area that I'm actually kind of most interested in is like food is medicine and how, how, what you're eating can actually change, um, change your genes to some effect or at least the expression of your genes. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. And you know, I, I, I completely agree with you that, um, that the, 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 how, you know, the seriousness at which nutrition is taken is not really, it hasn't been really fully like almost disclosed and people, it's not a common thing. Um, I mean, Dr. Ornish, for instance, his latest data on like gene expression, like within hours, like you start changing like gene expression and things after eating meals, you know, it's crazy. So, um, I think the, the, the fact that you had a nutritional perspective coming into even before pharmacy, uh, it's like what we need more because I think people don't realize how powerful it can be until when, once they see results, then people realize like, wow, you know, like I, I don't have to take these medications. I can do, um, I can do all of this. And so it seems like from your perspective, the, what you want to focus on is more you know, hey, people, you can use food so much more and then taking them off of medications. Yes. Yeah. And even when I'm recommending supplements, I'm recommending supplements as a bridge, right? So whether you're taking a medication or a supplement, to me, it's all like the work of taking something. And it's telling me that your diet isn't necessarily like dialed in maybe, or maybe you're not getting enough from your diet. And my personal perspective is, hopefully we can work to at least get the majority of what you would need from your diet. Um, and then you supplement where need be. Um, just like the word says, it's a supplement. It's not supposed to be like a forever thing necessarily. Um, so I think, you know, really working with food and one thing I've been uh, really passionate about lately is like the energetics of food too. So not just like not just looking at like the macronutrients or even micronutrients, but like, what is the energy of the food you're eating? Like, is it, you know, local from the farmer's market type of stuff, or is it shipped across the country and like, you know, picked three weeks ago. And I think that, um, even though it's more subtle, like that, the energy of the food you're eating, um, definitely impacts like your own being, um, which is a little harder to explain to people. <laughs> But I think there's something really to that. I think so too. I was in a study that I was reading about like if somebody believes that the food that they're eating it's you know it's nutritious and somebody believes that it's not, it can have different effects. Yeah. Um, and so like I can definitely see how like if I'm getting food from like this warehouse and it's like people are mad in there and it's just a horrible environment and there is like you know, childhood, like labor and like, I'm probably not going to feel too good about eating that food, you know, right. and it's probably going to affect me in some way more than what we think, you know? Yeah. And that's, I'm a big, I love gardening. And, um, so it's so different to eat stuff that I've grown and I feel really good about versus, you know, something that I maybe feel less great about. But one of the, um, resources I really like is the center for mindful eating. Um, and they talk a lot about like how important it is even like the energy that you come to the meal with. So like, are you sitting there thinking about how horrible your boss is or like something terrible that happened during the day and like eating your food while you're doing it? Or are you like calm and centered and peaceful and maybe talking with a loved one or, you know, just sitting there um, appreciating the food? So I think the energy with which we eat or like the mood and everything um, also has a big effect. And then 
it has an effect on how you digest the food, right? Because if you're like in that flight or fight mode, you're not going to digest. Like if you're resting um, and really um, able to like fully uh, digest and then assimilate, absorb and assimilate the nutrients. So um, I think there's just a lot more to eating and nutrition than we give credit. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, and, and I think I had a, recently we were doing an event and we were, I was like hanging out. Oh, I think you've met her with uh, Catherine McConkie, who's like a chef. She's, yeah. You know? and, she, and I was, and I was, um, and I was hanging out with her before the event, like trying to get all the food and everything, you know, and I was so amazed by the whole experience, like going like to the places and getting the food, like to the fishery and getting the fish to the person who bakes and get in the, it's like when I ate the food, it was so much more meaningful than, um, than just like at a regular, in a package, you know, cold, it's been in a truck for like 15 days. Like it tasted so differently. And, and, and one of my friends here, I was asking him, he runs like uh, multiple restaurants here in town and they're super good. And I said, you know, what do you think is the biggest thing? And he's like, just the, 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 the the source of the food you know mm -hmm. where this food is coming from can make such a big difference and the other thing that is interesting that you said was about eating together with somebody i think uh the guy from the blue zones um what was his name he did a bunch of the studies with the blue zones around the world and when they went back to try to replicate this in other communities they wouldn't see they couldn't see the results and then they implemented a, a weekly dinner with the people who were involved in these programs and then they started seeing results yeah you know and how so that's crazy right yeah it's incredible that's i think there's something so special about eating with people um and one thing we do cool around here is um we have it's called the lake pepin local food group and so we um bring together like farmers as well as like uh, just consumers, all different people in our area, but we have potlucks and they are like the most amazing potlucks you've ever been to. And I think that the bar has just been set really high, but everyone brings like a dish that they've like made. There's no like, you know, fruit tray from like the grocery store. Like people are bringing stuff that they've like made in like, oh, it's so good. But the energy of that food is so different than like the fruit from the grocery store or something, you know? Um, and it's just, it's such a fun event and it's just, it draws more and more people because I think the word gets out too. And around here it's, I'm in Wisconsin and it is cold and lonely in the winter. Like you are not necessarily out a lot. So when you get the chance to go out and like have a potluck with people and eat amazing food, like everybody shows up. So <laughs> I think there's definitely something to be said for community. Yeah. And it's so crazy. Like all the data that shows like, yeah. um, uh, like for teenagers, I think like they're great. Like if they have a weekly meet, if they have like a weekly dinner at home, their grades are as an average, they go higher. Mental illness as an average, they have less medications. Like it's so many benefits to, to these like, it's almost like a lost art that we have to like bring back. Uh, and, and like meals together is the best, you know? It's just yeah. so sick for everything. Um, there is a, uh, have you heard of like, I think there is a, a field called nutritional psychiatry. I think Australia. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And, and, and they've done a bunch of the work. I forget the lady's name, but she's an, uh, a physician, I think, uh, or, a, or a doctorate. Um, either way, she's done a lot of uh, research on nutritional psychiatry and how you can actually treat people through diets, you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, and I can, uh, oh, definitely, I can see that happening, you know? Yeah. Well, and just the psychology of food, I think there's so much emotion around eating, um, especially, I guess, like personally, um, I had an eating disorder young. And so for me, like food has a lot of baggage, <laughs> right? But it's something, it's not like an addiction where you can just say like, you know, like a drug addiction, like I'm, I'm stopping cold turkey, like you still have to eat every single day. And so finding a way to appreciate and like love food versus being fearful of food or like having negative associations with food, I think it really just changes 
your life and your health. And um, so people maybe don't have such an extreme experience with it, but I think even if you think of how food was um, talked about in your family or like a lot of people have the experience of like their mom always being on a diet or, you know, like, um, yeah, just there's a lot around food, I think, that um, creates a lot of emotion um, that we don't always necessarily address. Wow. And, and, and how, how have you been able to, like, piece, I think, I mean, also so much interesting, like everything that you've done, like nutrition and yoga, and how has this, all of these things, I guess, or how, what triggered to starting to, like, heal from this and overcome it in a way that now is almost like a, something that you can tap into to help other people, uh, you know, overcome their, what they're going through. How was that process for you? Yeah, it's an evolution and it's ongoing. I mean, I don't know that everyone would agree with me on this, but I feel like you never really get rid of an eating disorder. Um, it's always in the back of your head. Like, you can deal with it and you can learn ways to cope and you can, you know, um, kind of change your perspective, but it's, I think it's always kind of like there. So the biggest thing for me was, um, getting into yoga and really tuning into my body and my intuition and becoming really comfortable with myself. Um, I think was probably the biggest turning point for me because I think, think yoga was really a way for me to um, find confidence um, and just like an outlet um, to deal with a lot of emotion and self-judgment and those sorts of things. Um, and I had an amazing teacher. Like we were her first two students, my sister and I. And so we had a lot of one-on-one -on -one time and my parents bought us unlimited passes. So we would be there like two classes in a row or something. Um, and just like spend the afternoon with her. And so I think she had such a huge impact on my life. And one of the things she told me early on, early on that I think has stuck with me is she always would say accepting, non-judging. And so that's something that like continually plays in my head and it's not always easy to do, but I think it's just like a nice reminder and something that I tend to go back to. That's so good. I, I definitely, it's like, poof, poof, poof. So, <laughs> so many lessons from there. Yeah, you're so right. Like, um, accepting and not judging. I was just thinking about that word. Uh, because even like if I eat something in the hospital, and like if I eat a cookie or something, like, oh, I'm gonna, like, I'm the doctor who talks about like nutrition and like eating well and all this stuff. And, and there is so much guilt about it. Like, oh, and then even nurses is like, oh, hey, Dr. Zuleta, there you are. You know, and so I think we really have to like allow ourselves, like it's okay. Like, you know, like like it's okay to 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 um to have food that enriches somehow like an experience of like community or your soul or you know, whatever that is, like. I tell, so one of my students, I precept a lot of students. And so um, one of my students said to me, like, well, if someone gave you a donut, would you eat it? And I was like, well, it depends. Like if you gave me a donut from a gas station, probably not. If you made me a donut with like love and care and it was a homemade donut, absolutely I would eat it. Like, and I would appreciate it and I would be mindful and every bite I would think about how good that donut is, you know? And so I think, again, it's about the food and like appreciating what you have. And like, for me, a gas station donut does nothing for me, right? But like a donut that someone makes with love and like intention, of course I'm gonna eat that, you know? And I'm not gonna feel bad about it. And so I think, same thing with like a cookie. Like if you want a cookie, have a cookie, but just make sure it's a really good cookie and enjoy every bite of that cookie, you know? Yeah, that's so amazing because I mean, in that, like in our fellowship, when we were looking at the research for um, like whether human beings ate best, like there is all this thing about like the gladiators being like vegetarians. And, and so people think like, oh, that's the best diet. And then, but then you look at the people who were in the Arctic and the only way they survived was eating meat. And so it's like, are you gonna eat meat the whole time? Like, you know, it's probably not the healthiest thing, 
it does increase like a bunch of cancer markers. So like it's up to you, but if you're like stuck in the in the snow for like a month and that's the only thing that's gonna keep you alive, like okay, like you know, you just kinda of have to weigh that out, you know, and, and I think that flexibility was what allowed us to survive as a human race. That being that flexibility and now like you're right, if somebody's like has a disease that, that donut or that meat will make them so sick and throw up and then end up in the hospital with like colitis or something, then that's a different story. And so it's like, we're all different and we all are different at different stages of our lives. And yeah. sometimes maybe that's not the, the thing for us, but maybe sometime it will or, you know, and so I think people allowing that bio-individuality that, 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 that everybody's different and, and, and we're all different at different stages in our lives. And I love that, like accepting non-judgmental, you know? Yeah. That's when, um, so I was, I've been a vegetarian for a long time. So I started being a vegetarian in eighth grade and my mom basically what? was like, you're going to cook for yourself if you're going to be a vegetarian. <laughs> so I did a lot of cooking for myself, um, early on and, then um, I would be like pescatarian, I was vegan, I was whatever, you know, all through college, sometimes I ate meat, whatever. So I went a bunch of different ways, tried out everything. Um, but then when I had gestational diabetes, I was having a really hard time controlling my blood sugar on a vegetarian diet. And I wasn't eating like a junk vegetarian diet. I was eating really a solid vegetarian diet. Um, so I decided I was going to eat meat, um, but I decided that I was going to eat like the best meat I could find. So I went to a local farmer and we bought like a half of a pig and, you know, some cow and whatever. <laughs> and it was so funny because I was like, oh my gosh, I don't even know how to make this. Like, what the heck? But I just had a little bit of meat um, in place of like some of my starchier um, vegetables or like... Um, you know, like the beans and legumes and things. So I just added in a little bit of meat and I controlled my blood sugar the entire time. And my blood sugar actually was so much more stable and I never required medication or anything. Um, so I think for me, it was just finding something that I felt okay about. So it wasn't necessarily the meat that was my problem or like that I had a problem with. Um, but I like the whole industrial meat system, I have a problem with. And I feel like I wouldn't want to put... Um, kind of that energy into my body right and so I wanted like the the meat that I would feel good about and I would know how it was raised and I knew that they had like an okay life and were outside and those sorts of things and even the nutrition of that like higher in omega-3s and all of that um was uh really important for me and then when I ate it I was like grateful for that animal and you know thankful for its life and all those things but um you know, I didn't feel bad about it because again, you don't want to create that energy of like not appreciating or not enjoying what you're consuming. Yeah. You know, I think I was watching some, uh, there was like a, some one time, like years ago, I, I turned into like the, um, sur like survival, like in the wild. And yeah. this guy just got into like this crazy, like killing the animal that they were hunting. And the girl in the group, they could, they were like, they were like trying to survive in the Amazon and it was pretty crazy. Like no other group had survived and they just sent the most experienced people to survive this place, which was crazy. So this guy killed the animal with this like, kind of make, making fun of the animal and just, and she was so upset at him. And it's like, it's okay to kill the animal, but you have to honor it. Right, exactly. Honor it. Like, like like respect that that life was just given for you survival, you know? And, mm -hmm. and so I think, um, cause then you're more aware of like, you're not just going to go kill a hundred animals. It's just like you acknowledge the, the, the gift that that was one animal kept you alive, you know? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. That's, I think there's so much to be said for that. And we have such a, like a detachment from our current food supply or food system um, that, you know, like, I always think of my mom who says stuff like, you know, like, oh, that's gross to buy like a half a pig. And I'm like, what do you think it is in the grocery store when you buy it in all the pl plastic and wrapping? Like, it still was from a pig. Like, but she feels like it's cleaner because it comes from a grocery store, you know, somehow, or like less bad or like, oh, you bought a whole ch chicken from like the farmer, but like, 
she feels cleaner buying it at the grocery store, you know? So it's interesting, the perspective of like the grocery store has like the clean, sterile food, right? Versus like getting it actually from the farmer is like somehow more risky, which I don't agree with, but is certainly like a perception that's out there, I think. And hopefully it will change because I, I work really closely with a lot of farmers in our area. And I just love, like you kind of mentioned, I love seeing people's passion for what they do. And farmers are some of the most passionate people and really have such pride in what they're doing and growing, especially when they're doing like small scale vegetable farming or raising animals in like a really humane way. I think it's just so neat to connect with those people. And then, you know, to know that you're eating something that they made with such um, intention. So. Yeah. yeah, definitely. I think I was, I was looking at this um, documentary on about happiness and like, what are the pieces of it? And they interviewed a bunch of farmers and they had like some of the highest scores and they break it down to say that they were autonomous and self-reliant, you know? And so it's like, there is so much to say about that and they're so happy, you know, they're, they're just really, uh, not like this kind of, it's very grounded sort of way. Like they're just like real people, you know? And, and, um, and yeah, you're right. It's so uh, awesome to hang out around them because, because they're just real and they have such a, great relationship with what can be formed out of the earth, you know? Yeah. I think being out in nature every day, like who doesn't want that? Right. But like farmers are so underpaid and like not to get into too much political stuff, but like the crop subsidies and things that really encourage people to grow corn and beans and that sort of stuff really need to go away or be distributed more fairly to support those small farmers who are growing things that are actually healthy for us and life-sustaining versus kind of, I don't know, junk crops. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. probably not the right word, but the stuff that, you know, is turned into your corn syrup and yeah. processed soy isolate and all sorts of other stuff. But I think, you know, to subsidize those people who are working day in and day out to grow healthy food, to make healthy people, uh, makes a lot more sense to me. Yeah. And I think now as like the consumers are becoming more s smarter, you know, I think hopefully we'll start seeing that, that the dollars are going to pay, uh, vote, you know, for the people who are making this sort of food that is like healthy for us. It's like healthy for us. That brings me to what do you think about the whole opioid epidemic and how they got sued and, you know, all of that. Yeah. It's a mess. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. There's like, it's a mess. Like I, I feel terrible for people. I just this past week was talking with someone who was telling me um, they were coming in for their refill and they were saying, I would love nothing more than to get off of this medication, but I don't feel like I can. And I don't see a way of how, and that really struck me. And I was like, Oh my God. And we really don't have good systems for that. I think people just expect like, oh, well, you just need the willpower to stop. And that's not true. It's extremely addicting. And people have legitimate pain. Um, and we don't necessarily have great ways of helping them get off of medications, but still dealing with their pain. And I think the VA has been um, a really good example of doing a good job around this when it comes to integrative medicine and having like the group classes for pain. Um, and I like, I heard uh, one of the IFM lecture or I have the Institute for Functional Medicine at Cleveland Clinic, they did uh, grand rounds and they had a speaker from the VA. And he said, the one thing they don't talk about in their group pain classes is pain. <laughs> like they're not going to all talk about how much pain they're in, right? Because that's just going to make you focus on how much pain you're in. Um, but they're going to talk about strategies and like how they're coping and things that are working for them. Um, but also just, again, having that connection. Um, so I think pain is such a complicated thing. And I don't think that at this point there's any magic pill. Like when we talk about getting people off of opioids, there's not something else we're putting them on that's so much better, right? And so it's really finding how how do you deal with the pain that you have when it is chronic pain? And like, what expectations do you have about pain? Because at no point, even on opioids, are you going to be at zero pain more than likely? Um, and so keeping that pers in perspective, I guess. Um, but what's your experience with it? I'd love to hear. 
Yeah, no, I think I agree with you. Even some of the studies that came out, I think they tried it with Tylenol in the long term, and it was like the people could not tell the difference in terms of when they when they uh, lined the, the uh, which pill they were getting. If patients didn't know whether they were getting an opioid or a Tylenol, like it was almost the same results in the long term. So like it doesn't even work, you know. Yeah. So in the long term now it's just keeping up with the with the addiction of the brain. So I think. One of the experiences I had, I was doing a race and the lady sitting next to me um, was like 67. She had like four back surgeries and this is like a, a triathlon and, and she was, she said I was in bed for like seven years and I just had enough and I had to like rebuild myself and um, yeah, it's crazy, right? And so she says I was in pain meds and I was in all of this and I, and I couldn't see myself out of that bed. And then little by little, I built myself up and now she's doing like triathlons, you know? And so I think that's kind of like the best case scenario. But I think you're right. Like she was, there's not one pill. There are things I think from my experience that they're doing, like in Australia, they're using virtual reality to uh, where they, it's crazy. Like they cut, like they cut people and people feel the pain when they're seeing that they're getting cut, but actually it's just their virtual reality finger getting cut. And oh, it, wow. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. And so they, they start like, they have all these little activities and they actually have a truck that goes around to these areas where there is a lot of this and they have people experience this virtual reality for pain and it works part of it part of it of course like nutrition you know movement and i think with all those things in combine i think and then group therapies is, is, is mm -hmm. huge like the community part of it um and i think it's just finding those better alternatives for the management of the chronic pain like you know if somebody just came out of surgery and they're like knocked out in pain like yeah morphine like is perfect for that but like you know, in the long term, I think um, finding, I think what I've seen that people do the best is where they find like, where they try a bunch of things and then they find like the best things that work for them. Like it could be like fascia work or yoga or, um, or the virtual reality thing uh, or different little mind tricks, like whatever that is, or like magnesium or whatever, or a supplement. And so it's like, that they find the right combination of things that works for them, you know? And I think that's probably, it's just having the courage and the tenacity to go through that process to find, yeah. them, you know, and, and the team that takes you through it. I couldn't agree more. And that's, I think, um, like you kind of brought up, each person that's going to be an individualized solution, just like everybody's pain is different. And I think accounting for, um, like the emotional aspect of pain as well um, and the perceived experience and kind of that identity, especially with chronic pain. I mean, that becomes like your identity is like, I am someone who has chronic pain, you know? And so how do you shift that and shift how you think about yourself and how you perceive that pain? Um, I also like to look at chronic inflammation with a lot of the chronic mm -hmm. pain patients because um, mm -hmm. there's often an overlap there. And so like you mentioned, talking about diet and supplements and um, that like gentle movement. So really, um, you know, may, we're not going crazy, but like yoga, stretching, swimming, like doing things that get your blood flowing and give you some endorphins and really make you feel good. And so, yeah, I think those things are huge. And like looking at the joint commission, uh, recommendations that came out a year or two ago now, they're um, requiring some integrative pain management as options for people um, at institutions, which I think is awesome and a step in the right direction. Yeah, and you're right. Yeah, and, and it was great to see when we uh, worked with the people here at OHSU. I think we did an, I, uh, we rotated, I'm not sure if we had the, some of the fellows, I guess, had the experience of going through the integrative uh, pain management and they were taking it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so that was that was nice. I think, and they had some of the pieces that that take. I think what's missing is that big journey that happens afterwards. Mm -hmm. Like, it takes a big journey for people to actually heal from whatever happened. Like, and then like and then implement the things that are going to keep them out of pain. There is a great book called um, that I always think about this when I'm talking about this. It's called The Body Keeps Track. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so that's a great book to talk about, like how we get locked into these 
positions and then from trauma and then that leads us into like injury and injury and then we end up with like surgery and then that's another story yeah for sure absolutely and uh and amy and so what's the uh what's the what's the what does the future look for you what are you uh what are you working on and what's uh, what's the next years coming up for you look like yeah, that's a big question. I actually, I was just at Oprah uh, Saturday. I went to see Oprah for her like 2020 vision tour. And so that's like hot on my mind right now. <laughs> but um, I can tell you for sure <laughs> in the next few years, like getting way more into functional medicine. So I want to be, you know, doing a lot with functional and integrative medicine. And really, I'd like that to be my main job. Um, I think being able to incorporate a lot of the other things I'm trained in would be icing on the cake, right? So sometimes I tell my husband this all the time, and maybe it's not fair to say, it, but I, I think it's kind of true that sometimes being a pharmacist puts you in a certain box, um, where people don't expect you or, and maybe I'm limiting myself, but you're not expected or sometimes allowed to do everything you know how to do. Right. And so I want to be in a position where I can really bring it all um, and practice fully without holding back or, you know, like only doing what I think is allowed, like in my little box. So um, that would be my 2020 vision. <laughs> Thanks to Oprah. But um, also just like having trust in kind of the universe and that like my path will be made more clear as I go. Um, one of the fun uh, things I'm doing right now is I'm taking a master gardener training. Um, so one of, I, um, am super active, um, at our hospital. I helped along with our wellness committee to put in a hospital garden. So we grow, um, herbs and we grow vegetables and they're served in our cafe as well to our, as well as to our nursing home patients. And it was super helpful because my husband's a landscape architect. So he designed the gardens and then we oh. had a bunch of volunteers like put in these beds. And now I taught, um, like our kitchen staff courses or like little lectures on, how to use some of the herbs. And so we're using herbs as a way to add flavor to the food without adding like a lot more salt or things like that. And also just adding that freshness. Um, and it's been an awesome teaching place too, to just teach people about, you know, using fresh vegetables. So I was doing that. Um, I also volunteer, we have a community garden where, which is just amazing. So people get plots there and they garden and then everything they grow they've been donating to the food shelf and um where i work donates the space to the food shelf so the food shelf doesn't have to pay for any electricity or rental space um so the food shelf is at the hospital which is cool and so um what i basically did was i have all these pharmacy students so this last year i precepted like 17 pharmacy students so i made part of the rotation that they come with me every week down to the garden and we harvest produce um, and then we bring it to the food shelf and then they volunteer in the food shelf and help people select healthy meals um, because when people are at the food shelf it's for the month they're picking out their groceries so um, giving people ideas on how they can prep fresh fruits and vegetables things like that so um, anyway they spend time kind of learning about the social determinants of health um, and so and then I also planted the gardens at our local school. <laughs> so um, I planted and maintained the gardens and then um, taught all the, like the kindergarten class about planting and about um, eating fresh food and things. So I've been doing a lot of work around that. So the county um, statewide health improvement coordinator reached out and said, you know, would you be interested in becoming a master gardener? We don't have any in our county. And at first I was like, no, I don't have time. And then I was like, you know what? That sounds amazing. Like I might as well. <laughs> so that's my sort of random like project I'm working on right now. So, and then hopefully of course my own practice, I do some coaching on the side. Um, hopefully I'll do more with that. And then my podcast as well. I've been having a ton of fun with that. I feel like it's just the best way to learn from other integrative medicine professionals. Mm -hmm. Um, I just love talking with people. So hopefully that blows up. 
<laughs> oh, that is so awesome. Everything that you're doing with the gardening and everything. Wow, that sounds amazing. And it's amazing how like people hear about it and then you get these like opportunities like what you do, like the city asks you to do it, you know. Uh, and that's so cool. And that's so cool that the pharmacist students that you're training them to do that. Oh, that's just amazing. Because if they do that, like there is no medications. Like it, in a lot of the times, you know, for chronic conditions at least, you know? Yeah, this was the first year. So I made this rotation um, as a functional and integrative medicine rotation for pharmacy students. And a lot of the kids who I had were like, I didn't even know what that meant. Like <laughs> I signed up for it because there was free housing or something, you know, but then they come and it's a, it is, a, they were like, yeah, they were like, this is one of the hardest rotations I had because I give them a ton of work because there's a lot of learning to do. Um, but it's so hands-on and so we <laughs> get them out in the garden and you know we're doing a lot of stuff um, they go with Dr. Arietta once a week too um, we do consults with patients but anyway it's just really fun to see them grow and learn through the rotation and some of the kids have never put their hands in the soil like for real they have never gardened anything and so to have them like picking fresh vegetables and I'm one who's like taste this taste this try this you know it's just really fun to see people light up and a, like a good handful of the students were like when I get out of school I really want to plant a garden after being here and so I just I love that so yeah oh that's so cool that it is pharmacology you know you like you're putting chemicals into your body like that's how that's how it is and so that's amazing that you're changing. I, th I think it's almost like through education is the best way because like you're really changing like with these 15 students or, I mean, they go in, you know? And so well, that's awesome. And the new project I'm working on for this spring is um, I'm going to start giving out veggie RXs. <laughs> so if you <laughs> come in, um, we have some funding that last year in the clinic, they um, had some like, tokens or whatever that they could give out for people to go to the farmer's market and they didn't get given out. And so I said, what? No way. And so I was like, okay, well give them to me and I promise you I will give them out. So mm -hmm. this spring, um, one of my friends is the market manager in Wabasha, which is where I work. And um, I was like, hey, let's do this. Like I want to hand out these tokens. Um, so we're going to actually print up like prescriptions and I'm going to write like a prescription for just veggies. So you can't mm -hmm. go buy baked goods and honey and whatever else. Like it is going to be for veggies, but we're trying to figure out like, will it be a weekly thing or, you know, like a one-time thing. Um, but we have some funding from our hospital um, foundation that they're going to support it, which is so cool. So we're really turning like the P-H-A-R-M-A-C-Y into a F-A-R-M-A-C-Y, which mm -hmm. I think will be really cool. So that's um, so cool. Yeah, I'm super, super excited about that. And hopefully it goes well. And if anything, if nothing else, it's just an experiment. But um, one organization that I have been just keeping an eye on is Wholesome Ways. And they've been doing a lot of work around this too. And it kind of connects other people doing like veggie type prescriptions. Um, so hopefully I can glean some information and tips from them. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm sure somebody like that incorporates like a daily like vegetable into their life like it can change their life you know I mean it's just that simple yeah yeah we have um, a donor right now who's interested in donating some money to make an integrative space for us and the one ask I had was I would really like a cooking space because I think teaching people to cook and not in like a fancy way but just basic prep of vegetables is so powerful and really carries through into so many other areas so that's that's my big ask right now. We'll see if I get it. <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. I went to uh, Bastyr College in San Diego just to kind of check it out. They have an amazing kitchen. And it's like medical schools don't have this, you know, and it's such a part. Like somebody's eating that three times a day as an average, you know. And so um, we definitely need so much more to incorporate these sorts of things into the medical uh to the medical uh, education, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's, I personally love cooking, but I cannot say that I was ever a good cook growing up. Um, but I think once I graduated and just like watching cooking shows and trying it and like having my own garden, you just learn over time. And so 
think part of it's just having the intention that you want to cook, but having it in like a uh, medical school or even pharmacy school curriculum would be amazing. And I think it would also just open up that world to so many people who maybe have never considered it. Because I think if you don't grow up with a family who's cooking or, you know, it's not something that you're accustomed to, um, it, it, why start, you know? And so to have that trigger to start is so cool. Yeah, definitely. Amy, and um, what's, if we were looking at, uh, your, at a movie about your life, what would be one of the moments in the movie that we would be like, wow. <laughs> oh, I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> wow, like a good thing? <laughs> hey, whatever. I think, um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I've had a lot of really cool, cool life experiences. I, uh, I don't know. I think, yeah, one of the kind of wow things I did recently, which just was neat for me, I think um, I put on a wellness retreat. And so that was like a really big thing because we had 18 women come um, and it was an all day thing. And it was me and a friend and we had um, a yoga teacher who was one of my friends come and teach yoga. And we just, it was just a really like amazing day. And it was called the Nourish Your Soul Retreat. Um, and I did cooking there, so, and the food all came out amazing. So that's my wow moment, is that the food actually came out good, and it was fun. I got to cook in, like, a commercial kitchen, and it was just really fun. But, yeah, I guess that's my latest wow moment. And then just getting certified in functional medicine, that was, I think, you know, after having my kids, um, you all of a sudden appreciate time so much more and how little of it you have to do these things and so studying all of a sudden became a lot harder than when I was in college um so getting through studying for that doing the case report it was like 26 pages the case report and then like a 200 question exam um getting through all that and passing was just a really huge accomplishment so and then I guess having my kids <laughs> that's another like wow moment of my life I think um when I was 34 weeks pregnant I ended up having my appendix out, um, which was awful. And speaking of opioids, I was very glad for pain medication <laughs> on that day. Um, but, you know, I think it kind of shows you like the amazingness of your body and like how, how lucky I was to be in a place where they could do that. Like, so I went to Mayo Clinic and, um, they, when they were prepping me for surgery, he was like, you know, to be honest, I haven't done this surgery in anyone so far along, like so pregnant, um, laparoscopically, but we're going to try it. And if it doesn't work, we're going to slice you midline, deliver the baby and take your appendix. <laughs> it was like, holy crap. So I went into surgery, not knowing like, am I going to, um, wake up with a baby on my chest or, you know, it just, without an appendix. So um, they did it laparoscopically and got my appendix out and it put me into labor and they stopped my labor. And so then I was able to carry full term and deliver my healthy son. So it was just incredible. And I was so grateful for all of those people. I walked in when I was wheeled into the operating room. I've never seen so many people in one place. <laughs> they had like, you know, every team possible there, but I was just, yeah, so grateful for every one of them. And it was just such an amazing experience. And it really brings you back to like your own humanity and like, wow, these things do happen. And like, I'm just so grateful for all these people. So, yeah. Wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. I'm so glad that everything went well. And uh, what an amazing experiment uh, and experiences. And that's so awesome um, with functional medicine. I'm so excited to hear that because it's such an amazing tool uh, that definitely is so interesting and there's so much there and so thank you so much for for being on the uh, podcast and I look forward to being able to follow up and, and and track and see all the progress that you make and all the gardens that you're making and <laughs> the amazing people that you're taking of medications and I can't even imagine what's gonna what you're gonna do so that's great. Uh -huh. 
Thank you so much. And thanks for talking with me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, definitely. All right.